All right, we're going to get started. It is time. Some of the others straggle in here. So, um, the QR code will be on there a few times throughout. This is a link to uh, the PowerPoint. Um, you can download the, the click, kind of simple version, easier, quicker download, or the with pictures and stuff. Um, and then the video will be on there tomorrow sometime, the video of this. So, um, yeah, my name is Corey Gilbert, and I'm a professor of counseling psychology at Corbin University in Salem, Oregon. So I came from a little ways away um, and have been teaching and doing work in this field in this area for 23 years. Um, been a professor for, this is my starting my 20th year, and then um, a licensed counselor for 23. So that's kind of my life journey. I'm going to give you a little bit about, about me, but also about my family kind of throughout. Um, this one is very special to me. I have uh, three experiments at home. Um, you know what those are called. Those are your children. <laughs> and um, my experiments are literally my case studies. So let's start there. Um, case study. These are my two boys from a few years ago, about 2000, what, I think 18. Um, Love to go skiing. And my boys and I are skiing this, this um, is the last day of the season. And um, my middle son walks up to this young lady and she's wearing a sports bra. It's hot, it's the last day of the season. And he goes, why are you wearing that? Why is, why is she wearing that to this guy? And it's like, because she's hot. And the guy, the Blaze is confused. My son's name is Blaze. He's confused. Hot, which one? <laughs> hot, as in pretty or hot? Anyway, um, he's kind of confused and went on. Well, a few hours later, and there's a lot of people doing stunts. People were actually jumping off the top of the mountain with parachutes and just a lot of crazy stuff going on. But a few hours later, this... Um, young lady passes us topless. I'm like, oh shoot. Um, and so Blaze luckily didn't see. He would have been like laughing his head off and pointing fingers. Like that, that's his personality. But I saw that my son Alex had seen her and so I just chased after Alex. So I got to the bottom of the slope, got to him and I'm like, first time? He's like, yes. I was like, how was it? <laughs> and he's like, I don't know, I can answer that question. So we've had like a hundred conversations about that since then. But my biggest thing with him was, what's her story? Like, why would she do that? What was her story? And so having conversations about events and about um, having conversations about TV shows and movies and any little thing that actually can help them think for themselves has actually been critical. Shortly after this, about the same season, I took my three kids to this movie. Um, normally, I'm going to preview a movie. I don't know why I did not preview this movie first and then take them. So all three, even my little daughter. So I have two boys and my younger daughter. And we're watching this movie, and there's this, this scene where there's this girl in a red dress. She's, she's the avatar. She's uh, not uh, the main person, I think, the human. And I remember thinking, okay, I'm going to ask my kids afterwards what they thought about this. And so it's this scene right here, the red dress. And so afterwards, my oldest was like, I was very uncomfortable. Sitting there next to my dad in the movie theater, and this girl with this skin-tight dress was on. My middle son was like, so focused on the last scene in the movie where the guy gets kicked in the crotch. And just thought that was so funny, and, is, and he's wearing one of those suits that makes you feel it. So he, he's in the virtual world and gets kicked. He just thought that was the most hilarious thing. That's his personality. And my daughter was like, what a beautiful dress. That's all she could think about. It's like every, our kids are filtering everything they see through a lens that we don't necessarily know or understand. Like the little boy that's on top of his dad's shoulders at a parade, and at the end of the parade, the dad's like, so how was it? He goes, that was the most amazing truck show I've ever seen. <laughs> he could care less about all that fancy stuff. He's looking at the trucks in front of pulling the, the, the uh, floats, which is really interesting to think about. Their filter. And this is such, so apropos to follow Dr. Barna and what he talked about about worldview, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, what are age-appropriate conversations? So we're going to look at the ages, but then what are some really important hot topics right now that we must address. And I'm gonna go into some, some rough stuff that we're gonna to have to, to filter through and wade through. Many of you are youth pastors or in youth ministry. I'm gonna give you a lot of resources today that you don't necessarily need to read. Some of you are readers, great. Most of you might not be or don't have time. There's other ways to get that information. So I'm gonna kind of show you how to do that. 
is how do we filter through all the junk that's out there to learn and be equipped to serve and lead? Uh, I wanna help give you that, show you that today. Um, my focus is sex ed. I'm known on campus as the sex guy. Um, my first year teaching at uh, the, actually Tacoma Falls College is where I used to teach. Um, my first year teaching, the, they had a chapel with the counselor and they asked the question about masturbation. And like always, no one wants to talk about the subject. And so the counselor on stage in front of the whole student body says, oh, ask Dr. Gilbert, he's an expert at that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, dude. Right. <laughs> so I, didn't, I heard about that for weeks. It's like, I heard what you're an expert at. <laughs> Great. So how do we do this? How do we do it when, our, when parents aren't taking responsibility? which is then where we come in as a church. And I believe the local church needs to be at the forefront. I've told our youth pastors, if you taught on nothing else on your evenings that you have youth ministry, like, you know, sermons, besides sexuality for the next year, you still wouldn't have covered enough. And I know there's other subjects we probably need to cover. It's frustrating because the world is so loud about this subject, so, so loud. What are some things that we need to know? We need to learn, know the basic human sexuality. It's something I've been teaching for 19 years, a, cl a class, a basic human sexuality that I believe is so critical, and it's a theology of. I remember one year, um, my son was visiting the class because he was sick, we homeschool, and so he came to, to work with me, and he was sitting in class, and I, as class was about to start, realized what the subject was on, and it was a theology of masturbation. I'm like, ah, oh, great. All right, let's do this. So I taught the class, and it's Tuesday, Thursday class. At the end of class, he was like, can I come back Thursday? <laughs> yes, sir. Absolutely. To teach them, and that's kind of where we're going to be going, is we've got to teach them young. A few years ago, California stated that you need to, that California schools in kindergarten needs to teach all 15 genders. I'm not sure where they got 15 because Facebook's in California and there's like 90 on there, so they need to talk to each other. But um, and parents started freaking out. What do we do? What do we, how do we, we can't send our kids there. But then they would say this. I would tell them, you need to teach them at home. And they go, oh, they're not old enough yet. Oh my gosh. It's like, exactly. I'm sorry, I'm you're sorry. fine. <laughs> exactly. It's like, you're, you're going to send them there for them to teach what you won't teach them at home. And here's this. This is not science per se. I believe kids tend to lean towards and believe what they hear first. And if we're silent, we're not getting it to it yet. Our kids aren't old enough. No, we live in a different world. We need to be teaching them this stuff at a younger and younger age, which is frustrating. We need to become a confident parent. How is through knowledge? You need to learn some of this stuff. That's part of what I did in my book, the uh, red one there, the, I can't say that, was to equip parents to actually think through what they believe. It's not to tell you what to believe. It's to help think through what you believe. You figure out what you believe through scripture and some explanations of these different topics to prepare your kids well and you well for those conversations now we need to know about the theology of sex your brain and sex the brain and love the theology of marriage i don't believe we have a strong theology of marriage we we see we've seen such a decline in marriage lately we need to talk about that well um, because here's the here's the scary part either i do or someone else does period Who's going to have these conversations with your kids? It's either I do or someone else does. So what I have coined kind of in my book was this idea of micro-conversations. And what I realized later is they aren't micro-conversations. They actually might be mini lectures. <laughs> we want conversation with our kids, but we don't always get it, especially as they become teenagers. And so parents stop talking, and I'm like, no. It may not be a conversation, but I'm still planting seeds. If I'm speaking to them about sexting, I'm still planting seeds, even if they just grunt at me. So keep talking, keep engaging. And so we're going to talk through today a little bit about what do we talk about? What are those age-appropriate conversations? So let's start with birth to five. These are, this is my daughter Miley and my weird, crazy boy, Blaze. Um, it's rarely too early. And this is what I really want to kind of hammer in is it's too, rarely too early. You could talk to your kids about something and then not get it. It's okay. It's like they don't know where to hang it in their brain. They will eventually. And when they do... It's like my daughter, one day we were sitting at the dinner table and all of a sudden she's like, penis, vagina, what? 
And we all just busted out laughing because her brain finally caught up with what she's been hearing us talk about at home all the time. Because we talk about pornography, masturbation, and all this stuff all the time at practically every dinner. Because it's just a normal, this is normal and healthy for us to talk about. So basic anatomy is where we need to start. Why do we need to teach kids basic anatomy? This is the number one reason why. Trauma. Mm -hmm. Sexual abuse. I need to teach them language for them to not, for them to have language to know what to say or what to do if something happens. One day my daughter stood up in the bathtub and she grabbed herself and she's like, my bottom hurts. And I was like, that's not your bottom. What are you talking about? And my wife goes, I didn't know what to call it. <laughs> the language matters. Do we call, call a vulva a vulva? We call it what it is so that she has language. And then one of the things that we did from, from a young age was we would actually ask our kids when we had babysitters, did anyone touch you, do anything, change your diaper, change your underwear, panties, whatever. We'd ask these normal questions every time. Not looking for them to tell us the truth. Because shame tends to silence the truth. But for them to change the way they've answered it the other hundred times. We're looking for that change in the way they would answer because shame has stepped in. That's, that was the key for us. And I would say the same thing in my classes because those college students were the ones babysitting my kids. So they knew they were, that my kids were being asked that because you know, I wasn't doing it behind their back, if you will. But we need the correct body part vocabulary. We need to call a penis a penis, not call it a wee-wee or whatever else you come up with. Call it because of the trauma stuff. We want to have language that they can actually use and it's normal. Another big one is be sure not to stereotype what is boy or girl, but emphasize that they are a boy or a girl. This is a newer one, but it's not anything new. We need to go there. We need to talk about this. I really struggled with who I was because I didn't fit into the categories of boy and the boy stuff that people typify of boys. And so I really I spent lots of years struggling because of this. And so doing and teaching this stuff has been very dear to me because of my own just questions about myself. And that they are loved by God and their family. These are some foundational pieces, birth to five, that we're starting with. And they recognize that brothers, sisters, parents, friends, and bodies are different. They start noticing that, hey, that person's in a wheelchair. That person's different than me. Okay, help them notice it and then help them to learn not to point it out in public and not to, like my middle guy would do, just like, hey, look! <laughs> Please, stop. <laughs> we'll talk after. Um, help them see that, recognize that. Uh, begin teaching about appropriate touch towards and from others. Dignity and permission. Help them understand some vocabulary around what is and isn't okay is really, really important for us to, to begin st establishing here. Birth to five. Birth to five is a critical area of development. And dads are so critical at this stage. And so often dads don't check in until six or seven when they can throw a ball. They're so critical at this birth to five stage of shaping and if it's not dads, it's other men in their life who are so critical for this stage. This stage is marked by curiosity and exploration. And by the way, those that came in later, um, there's a QR code that'll show up every once in a while. It's all throughout. And you can download the slides and the video will be on there as well. So just so you'll be able to catch it here kind of coming up. Um, some of the things that we did at this stage of life with our kids is we had these books sitting on our shelves. So this is a book set of four. The older versions were prettier and had prettier pictures on them, but uh, we had them mixed in their books. And every once in a while they'd get them out and talk about it, or they'd ask a question and we'd go, hey, go grab that book. We would talk it and read through it. Um, the good pictures, bad pictures is one of my absolute favorite. Um, it talks about the, the brain and how it works in basic neuroscience. And so, and I'll summarize it here right for you. And it was my son, middle son Blaze, one day was outside in the front yard and he was standing in the front yard kind of doing this. And I'm like, Blaze, what are you thinking? He goes, Dad, my feeling brain says I want to go across the street to the park. And my thinking brain says I'll get in trouble. Mm -hmm. Like You just summed up neuroscience. Thank you. <laughs> it's crazy how simple some of this is. And they can get it. What are good pictures and what are bad pictures? And starting them to understand that they're nudity. It can be beautiful. It is beautiful, but it's got a place. And it's got a boundary. And, and teach that young because they're going to get see it. And that was a question I had when they were, they were younger. I was like, when do I show it to them? Like, how do we have this conversation? So that, that moment on the ski slope when that girl came down was an amazing time to go, okay, let's talk. 
let's talk about what you saw. Let's talk about what you felt. Let's talk about how that, how weird it was and, and exciting and I'm confusing and all the, all the same, all the stuff. Same for with pornography. Um, we need to be able to talk about this kind of stuff. Ages 6 to 10. I would say this is the most incredible, incredible and important time and this is the time we miss. Most parents that I hear say, oh, I'll address it when they turn 13. It's too late. It's never too late, but you're going to have a steeper hill to climb because they know it all. Like I literally, I laughingly say, but I need to sit at my kids' feet and learn from them. I have three teenagers, so it's like, what can I learn from you today? Because they act like it. They know it all. Duh. They are in that developmental fight for their life in terms of worldview, which is really important. So, again, there's no such thing as the talk. We need to break that, to destroy that mentality of I'm going to have the talk. It's a million micro-conversations, a million of them. While you're driving in the car, when the show is on television, I remember, uh, we, I love the, the sing-off type shows, and two kids walk up to sing, and they start sharing their story that they were twins, and they were both boys at one point, but one had transitioned to be a girl, and my son was like, wait, what? Pause, conversation. Recently, I actually sat down with my oldest, uh, who was probably 16, we'll get to that in a minute, but, and we watched the first season of 13 Reasons Why. It was horrible. It's a horrible show. It's an important show. The day it came out, if you don't know what that is, it's about a girl who has committed suicide and she leaves 13 cassette tapes telling 13 people why they knew a part of the story and why she killed herself. It's a horrible, it's a really important one. Except what we saw, so when it came out, I asked my students in my college, the college I teach that class, how many have seen it? And over half the class had binge watched it over the weekend. What's happening is kids are watching it alone in the room and not processing it, and suicide mm -hmm. rate's gone up, not down from this. Mm -hmm. We need to talk about this stuff. We don't joke around about suicide. We run at it with everything we've got to make sure that they know it's not a joke. Sad thing like with her in that show, no one really knew. Well, except one, the counselor. And that's, that's where it's messy. If you haven't seen the show, hardest thing about the show is it's got a lot of language, and the episode 12 has a, the rape scene right before she commits suicide. It's not done in a, it's done tastefully, but it's, I just sat there and bawled because I deal a lot with that, with, with clients, um, dealing with rape and stuff like that. So why do I do that? Why would I sit with my kid? Why? They need to know what the real world's like. And honestly, my kids have never seen a locker because we homeschool. So <laughs> to see what high school's like, see what some of this stuff's like, and to talk through it. What are you thinking? What are you feeling? Has been really powerful. This stage here, we get into a more descriptive anatomy. They need to understand them and the language and understand um, what how their bodies are made and that they're made different. We need to talk about the M word. We need to be able to say masturbation. We need to, be able to talk about masturbation. You know, I ask my boys about their masturbation practices every two or three weeks. They they answered me when they were younger, and now they don't. They grunt. But we're talking about it. And it's literally this. I'm moving it out of their unconscious, into their conscious, and they are stewards of their conscious. And it's taking thoughts captive. And you are going to be the kind of man that's actually trustworthy or not. Who are you today? They don't have to answer me, but I planted a seed again. And I asked two weeks later, hey, how's it going? What's your practices there? How are you doing? Are you looking at pornography? And they're straight up yes or no with me now. Um, and do we need to do something? My one, one son one time went, Please, uh, his iPod, please take off Spotify. Because I keep adding Spotify and then I find the pictures, the little icons of naked. I didn't know you could do that. Thanks for telling me. Absolutely, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll fix that. Um, so that's not normal that they actually come to you. That's, and we'll get to that again here in a minute as well. This is the time of talking about sexual identity. Who you are and how you're made. And we're going to talk about this more in depth in a little bit. Um, there's so much confusion today. What is it? Over 25% of the current generation believes that they're LGBTQ something. They're lost trying to find themselves. But in the same way that you and I possibly were, but in a different way. Whether it was career or, or some other identity or am I really a man? Or am I really a woman? Am I, am I marriable? Am I on and on and on? The questions we ask. About dignity and modesty. How to help my kids understand, and we did this after that, that thing happened in the, 
uh, on a ski, ski slope, had to help them see that that young lady that was wearing that sports bra, you don't have a say what she wears. So careful. And so having conversations about them and how they view someone else, and then the easy part we had, which is to judge, mm -hmm. saying careful with that. Be very careful. We're planting seeds there. Periods and wet dreams <coughs> prep. You start having these conversations at 6 to 10, not when they're there. You want to prep them. I've talked to too many young women who've had their first period and thought they were dying because they've never had a conversation with their mom or someone and they, they experience this totally, totally alone. And I see a lot of heads nodding. It's, it's not okay. There are young girls that walk into a crisis pregnancy center and don't know how they got pregnant. They don't understand that that's... So there are still people that are ignorant that penis vagina does this. They don't understand that. They haven't been trained. One girl, I remember, she had she had uh, five STDs and didn't even know what intercourse was because of her abuse from people. It was really, really heartbreaking. Discuss gender. That's a new word. Didn't exist before. So we got to talk about it. Your gender is separate from your sex. No, it's not. But we'll get to that in a minute. Um, and so how do you play that out? How do you help understand culture that's talking about gender is separate than, from your biological sex, your birth assigned or your sex assigned at birth. What do you do with that? We need to talk through that stuff and help them think through it and understand that. Sexual reproduction. Their personality is set um, in stone by age seven. And we heard today from, from Dr. Varna, the, what age was world, worldview? 13. Again, think about this. For this topic especially, we're going to start talking about it when they turn a teenager. 12, 13, oh, 13. <laughs> it's not a magical age. Had one friend of mine who, his son was 13 and 14 and 15. And he's like, oh my gosh, he still plays with Nerf guns and he's still such a kid. And 16 and 17, he's still such a kid. And, oh, he's 18 and he's going off to college. Oh no, what did I do? Yeah. And you should have talked about this about with him all along, even though he seemed to be childlike. Because he grew up really fast in college and he's actually doing really well, but... He's had a huge, deep, you know, learning curve to go into that next stage of life. Boyfriend, girlfriend. We don't talk about this stuff in teenage years. We establish as a family early on what those parameters are going to be. So for us, you can start dating when you're a junior and a senior in college. I jokingly say that. But it's stop the pressure. Yeah. The pressure is if there's something wrong with you if you're not dating someone at 12. Or 10, let alone 16, which somehow we made as the age to start dating. It's like, no. Actually, maybe let's aim for the driver's license, which that's now not happening for some. But, so why, why later? Why, I want you to have a plan. If you meet someone, so my, my middle guy has this girl she likes. He's 16. And it's like, so if you continue on this road, you're going to be married the next couple of years. And he's like, oh, but I want to go to college. I'm like, you got some decisions to make. And it's been fun to watch him battle and wrestle with. I'm all for you getting married at 18. 100%. I believe marriage is how you're created. was to be married and to have children. And not everyone will. But you start that journey of dating. You're going to get married or have a baby in two years or so. That's not some magical number. But it's not going to be long. Because for some reason the sexual. We seem to not be able to stop. Not be able to. Keep her hands off. So what about... So again, your family has to establish what are those parameters? Where where do we... And so we're, if you're in ministry, you're shaping a whole herd of families and kids. And So the way that you speak about that also is really important to help guide them to think. Just think. Is 16 really wise? And I'd say absolutely not at all. Unless you want a baby within two years or less. Because right now, the sexual ethic of this generation is one of... I have never been on a date, but I've had sex with eight people. That's too normal for men and women. Sex is easy. Having a date, going, going on a date, that's too big, too, too hard. How to be a friend. Pornography, we've got to talk about this stuff. It's everywhere. I call these porn portals. If you love your child, give them a porn portal. <coughs> what do I need to do with this? I open it up and I click on Safari. And I type in, I'm going to go to Google. Not Google Translate. 
And what happens on Google? I can type in P O R N. My wife loves them. She sees my phone and sees this. And what's the first option? Pornhub. What's the next option? X N X X, whatever that is. It's just text right now, but if I click on any link or pictures or video at the top, my life is never the same. And kids are not looking at pictures. They're going to graphic, 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 graphic video, void of intimacy, all about abuse and power, multiple people. It's not okay. Yet our world goes, hey, you do you. No. We need a biblical sexual ethic. Why we don't. Why we don't go there. We need to talk about that. You talk about trauma and abuse. This, this is the season when so much happens. When something happened and we didn't realize that uncle so-and-so, when he visited, this happened. Or this happened with brother or sister or his babysitter or some usually trusted person. 91% of abuse happens from someone that was trusted in the family. Only 9% is the stranger danger. So we need to actually go there and talk about that. That they are under authority. It's amazing how we have no authority with adolescents these days, it seems like. Parents don't. Why? Because they didn't learn that they're always under authority. I want my sons and my, my daughter to respect the police and firefighters and everyone. And that's, in, that's taught at the home level in terms of that, them and us. But then more importantly, and most importantly, that they're under the authority of Christ. That he's always there for them and there with them. Um, and this season is marked by experimentation and pushing boundaries. We know that. We're trying to figure out how, how hard you'll how hard you'll push back. Do you really believe? Do you believe? Do you really? Are you going to do what you say you're going to do? All that. Um, this is normal. Expect that. Now, for our kids, um, all three of them at age nine, we did this passport to purity. Uh, my oldest son, he was really girl excited, so at nine years old, him and I took off, went to the coast, and spent a weekend together. It was amazing. Great conversations. My next boy comes up, he's nine, we did it, and we didn't make it halfway through. Because he's like, penis! <laughs> he's just a little goofball. So we had a great weekend, and at 14 we went and did it again. <laughs> and had a great weekend. A very honest conversation. My wife recently did it with our daughter, who's 13. And what is this? It's very simple. I've heard a lot of my age people say that this actually harmed them. Passport purity. And I wonder, I don't I don't know, but I wonder if that there weren't there wasn't a lot of conversation with it. Because what it is is you go and you listen to some audios of Dennis and Barbara Rain and talking to some really good stuff, you do some little activities and you have some fun time. But if you don't talk deep as to what are you thinking, what are you feeling, how is this, how are you reacting? Um, what do we do with this? Then I, I wonder if that's the harm. I don't know. Um, again, I have three experiments. We'll have conversations later, and I'll stand up here and tell you that <laughs> in a few years. So. But is this a material? Or yes. Is this a, a yes, you can order that from Amazon and, and their website. Okay. Is that a retreat or mm -hmm. that you do it on your own with you as, your, okay. as a mom or dad with your child. Perfect. Um, really, really neat resource. Um, and I'll show you some others coming up here in a minute too. But this is one I have liked. Again, I've heard others say they did not like it. And so that's where I highly suggest it. Yeah? yeah. I have a question not about this, but about this social media thing. Do you think there is an age that is appropriate for kids to use social media? Because the solution for me, for them to not have access to like pornography and all of these websites, is just to not use it until like. School or college. We're going to get to that. Okay. Exactly what we're going to get to. Yes. And I would say 18 plus. Mm -hmm. My oldest just turned 18. He has got Instagram for the first time. And that's been interesting already. Mm -hmm. He's been 18 for two months. <laughs> so, um, and amazing conversations. But we'll, we'll get to that. Some really important information about that. So, what do you do at this age? So, 11 to 17. Um, again, micro conversations. These tend to be mini lectures at this age. They start shutting down more with you, potentially. If you have a child that actually talks to you more, know that's actually not normal. The norm is they sh start shutting down and turn to some of these more sensitive conversations. If you started earlier, you're going to plant a seed of normality in the home that, hey, we're going to go there. Um, so that's, again, you create that. And, and that's what we want to start teaching our families and our parents and our teens. What about the teens in our youth group who don't have this? 
we become that for them. And we have to be really careful with the boundary of that. I know. But someone's got to talk about, hey, how's, how's it going with your managing your head, your heart, and your fantasy life? And, hey, masturbation, pornography, how you view men, women, marriage. We've got to talk through that honestly, openly. And it really is on the one-to-one. Here's my oldest, Alex, just did his Eagle Project. And then Blaze just cut his hair. It's so sad. But <laughs> my son Blaze gave it to Locks to Love. Had more than his sister did. But um, This is puberty, dating, marriage, gender, sexuality. All It's all of this mess. Identity is so much more than sexual. Mm-hmm. Who you are. And, and I'm, I'm a college professor, so I have students that come visit the university I teach at, and they, they want to come there, and it's like, what do you want to major in? And <coughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's okay. Actually, wrong question. What is God calling you to? Because what I'm seeing is mom and dad and others are like, you're so talented here. You're so, this is really, you're really good at this. Go here. And God's going over there. Mm-hmm. Uh, listen to him, God. Forget your parents. But that's hard to say. I tend to say that in front of the parents. But careful with that. But it's important. And ask that question over and over and over. Where is God calling you? Where is God calling you? I went to college in music. My heart was... My passion was music. I grew up in Chile, South America, missionary kid. And my goal was to go back overseas and be a music missionary. And then I found out you have to have talent. (laughs) (laughs) So my junior year, they sat me down and said, you're not graduating. You need to find a new life. And I fell apart. And I had one opening for a class, one elective, and I took a counseling class. Two weeks after graduation, I'm in seminary, and I'm heading on a a route that I couldn't have seen if my life depended on it. Then I got into counseling, got my doctorate, still single, and um, I didn't, could, still couldn't see what was around that corner. To see teaching is something I love to do. And so I, I all these turns, like if I would know what was around the corner, I probably would have quit. Mm-hmm. Honestly, most of us probably would. If my wife had known what she's going to have to deal with, with me in marriage, mm-hmm. she would have quit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she's stayed through 21 years. So they were fearfully and wonderfully made. We've got to. Feed that in and teach that to our children. As a believer, that your body is a temple. It matters what you do. Um, every other sin you commit is outside your body. And understanding that actually there's, diff- there's something different about sexual sin. And it's not okay. The ethic that we have taught in our society where kind of anything goes. That the sexual expression and experience is meant to be in marriage. One man, one woman for life. That you're not a mistake, not trapped in the wrong body, but you have a unique personality. That's where I struggled. Because everything in me was very different than what the norm was. And so I, it just meant that something was wrong, broken. And I really wish someone had taught me that, that, that who I was was fearfully and wonderfully made and had a purpose. Because today I couldn't do what I do without some of the things that God put in me and made how he made me, how he wired me, even the health issues I have. Allow me to do my work better, which I think is pretty interesting to think about. Um, I deal with sexual abuse and trauma and affairs and all this sexual crap, and I have low, low testosterone, so it's great because I don't have to fantasize. <laughs> like, it's neat to see God in His God, what are you doing? actually protects me from myself. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I could do that kind of work if I had kind of the normal level of how men tend to be wired. And so, God is perfect. Mm-hmm. How do we help? Our young people see that, your talent, your skills, all of it, and understand sexual reproduction. Again, it blows my mind how many don't understand sexual reproduction. Refrain from sexual immorality. Who are your idols? What are your influences? So I mean, when I was a kid, it was always about posters on your wall. It's kind of who you put up, singers, and, and, and then who, who's influencing you now? And now it's through podcasts and reels and YouTube channels, and it's it's such a crapshoot, if you will. So knowing what they're listening to, and there's a lot of stuff I've listened to lately that I've not wanted to listen to, to kind of go, what are, what's influencing you? And then having great conversations, which has been fun. Dating, courting. I love the word courting, even though it's a kind of an old school word. But you don't do this alone. Like if you go out even on a date, why do we have to do everything alone? That, People knowing who you are and where you are and who you're with matters. My wife and I's second date, 
I ended up meeting her parents because she they came to the small group to check me out. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what do you do is important um, on that date and the boundaries you have. Again, pornography. And then what about social media? This is the stage where it's all about social media. So how do we manage that? And we're going to talk about that here coming up. And this is marked again by experimentation and identity. Um, how are you treating others are another other important question. What does the Bible say, not mom and dad or social media? Having them go to scripture for quest for answers and helping teach them that and model that. That's that worldview. Um, deep in identity, are you kind, respectful? And what's your work ethic? What kind of per person are you? You want to you know, emphasize that, help, help them see that. What is this LGBTQIA plus world? What is, what, they have, most of our teens have friends, if not themselves, that are identifying and or struggling. Many aren't even struggling, they just are. How do you relate to, love on, uh, walk alongside, be best friends with? It's so critical, not those people. We need to actually be in a relationship with, loving on, pointing to the cross every single time that we can, that we're allowed to. Um, beware of decisions that can't be unmade. Because remember, they're invincible. I should show you the video I have right now, but my son with some friends just a few weeks ago went to the coast, Oregon coast, and they decided to get a picture or a video. Luckily it was on video, but they, the, the waves were hitting this big rock and splashing it up. So they climbed up on this rock and they stood there, both of him and his buddy, my oldest son, and the next wave was a little stronger and knocked them off into the ocean. And honestly, they could be dead, but we saw the video so then sitting on the couch showing it to us laughing and we're like, I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> the video looks edited, it's on my Facebook page. It looks edited because they're there and then they're gone. The wave mm -hmm. is so hard, so fast. It's terrifying how easily life ends. It's terrifying what could have been. Um, then we were in a car wreck a few weeks later um, in our RV, my son was driving someone someone um, hired to play next to us right in front of us and we just he just nailed the car in front of us mm -hmm. and handled it like a champ just so incredible his heart rate didn't even go up i checked his watch later <laughs> <laughs> it took me two days for me to calm down um our, some of our kids are resilient mm -hmm. and some of us are invincible we think teens and that's what my wife worries about is those two events right now are feeding on my son this i'm invincible thing so now he's doing dumb things. He's gotten to 56, I think, no, 62.3 miles, miles per hour on the snowboard. 62 miles per hour, crazy boy, but again, invincible. So how do we teach them, not, I almost need bad experiences to kind of slow some of us down a little bit. And then maintain integrity of your convictions and what God is saying. They need to know what they believe back to worldview so critical now this is a book that came out in 2024 recently i just started reading it uh, it's all research it's a lot of nerdy stuff it's fun um and his final four or kind of his four pieces are accumulate uh married people accumulate much greater wealth than people who don't marry their more meaningful lives compared to their single or childless peers um and then a we before me approach to married life are happier and less divorce prone and they forge family first marriages characterized by frequent date nights, family fun times, and chores done with the kids. They enjoy the happiest marriages. Marriage is on the decline. We need to give a, an ethic of marriage being the norm and help invite people. We spent too many years saying 50% of marriage is divorce, and it's not true. Right. Shanti Feldman has debunked that. At the highest, it's about 33%. And if you go to the church, read your Bible, and don't live together before marriage, have a college education, and there was another one. Get married actually a little later. Um, the divorce rates in the teens, like 17%. We don't need to fear marriage. And so, a teaching an ethic for our kids, I think, is critical. Vodi Bakum says this I raise my sons to be husbands and fathers, and my daughters to be wives and mothers. I love that statement. And he says, I know they may not be. But I'm raising them towards that goal. That's the opposite of our world. It's what do you want to do when you grow up? We want to be. We want to accomplish. And it's like, um, it's not, not about those things. 
We need to be careful about the way we lock into that as my identity. First thing we ask when we meet someone, what do you do for a living? I love talking to people and letting them for hours not know what I do for a living, especially with what I do for a living. <laughs> and I've been in small groups where they have no idea what I do for a living, and it's so great. And then when they finally do, all of a sudden the whole, like everything changes, and it's like, dang it. Because they think, oh, we're shrinks in the room, so I'm going to therapize or whatever magic thing. I, I don't know. <laughs> it's crazy. This is our norm, though. You know this. You see this. You actually probably do this, I have to say. We're the worst examples. Parents, adults, you need to put the phones down. You need to actually maybe get rid of the phone or maybe put it somewhere else. Our phones are actually a problem, and we're seeing that more and more and more and more in the data. We knew that. It's crazy we have to have data to tell us, but this is not okay. That one there with the mom and the daughter modeling, they're doing what we're doing, so much of them. But they're actually also watching their peers, and so that's another huge factor. Now another resource that came out in 2019 was this one, Calling the American Mind. It was mentioned in one of the talks. I um, love this book personally because it says, it gives us some, some action to do. Is it 100% right? Is it, no. This one and the next three or four I'm going to show you are not Christian authors. And that's actually what makes me sad. Why are some of these secular researchers saying what I'm not hearing from a lot of Christian researchers? That's why it was so nice to hear Barna speak. The three bad ideas, avoid adversity at all costs, always trust your emotions, the world is black and white. And then he talks about in his book the idea that our kids are anti-fragile. We're treating them like they're some fragile thing. No, they're anti-fragile, as in they need to be stressed <coughs> to grow. They need to, they need to actually fall, scrape their knee. They need to take risks. But we've actually done some, some damage by not allowing them to do that. And, and it's understandably why um, we are more aware. Like normally, in the, in, or in the past, our, my kids would have come home and said, hey, we stood on this rock and we got knocked off and ha ha ha. And we're like, oh, that sounds stupid. And we move on. And still we have a video now that my wife and I've watched like a hundred times <laughs> going. <gasps> so when we go snowboarding, we, go, we have a GoPro on our helmet. So Alex has a reel of all of his falls. <laughs> he just... <laughs> And it was great as he knows how to fall and roll and he's back on his board and keeps going. For Blaze and I just go splat. <laughs> the difference between an athlete and a non-athletes. Alex is very athletic and my other son and I are so not. So we go splat. Our kids need to be stretched. They need to stay at home. They need to, they need to take a walk to the store. They need to actually have some freedoms that we have not allowed them. And we, we, we'll talk some more about that in a second too. Now, because again, this is what I call a porn portal. This is the norm. This is access to the whole world. We've got a problem here. Um, so some documentaries on Netflix, or a documentary on Netflix I highly recommend, The Social Dilemma. Watch this documentary, show it to your youth group, show it to your parents. If they haven't seen it, it's on Netflix. It's really good. It's a conversation piece, that's all it is. It's not meant to be the gospel or meant to be anything. It's meant to have, what, you gotta have people who disagree. They're gonna fight. Schools that have tried to have not have cell phones, who are the worst fighters against it? The parents. I want to be able to call my kid at any point in the point that age. No. Or don't put them in there. It's like, we need to talk through, so how do we fix this? This one has, like, the, the guy that invented the like button. He's like, I thought I was bringing joy to the world, and instead I created monsters. It's like, yeah, you did. You actually created a whole world that we couldn't even dreamed was happening. Same for the iPhone. Steve Jobs was just trying to put together a phone and an MP3 player and uh, what else? Oh, camera. It was miraculous for a year. And then as apps started grabbing on, it started turning into a whole different world. I believe he rolls over in his grave with what it turned into. Because we know for most of them, most of these tech people do not even let their own kids have these devices, which is so interesting. Another one is this one. 2021, it's on YouTube, Childhood 2.0. It starts off with talking to parents, interviewing parents, why, what's the most dangerous thing for your kids? And they have to go outside, anything outside of my house. I won't let them outside my house unless I'm with them. And then they go through data after data showing this is the safest 
era, time we've ever lived in in the history of America. And the worst, the most, big, the most danger you have is the cable connected to your house coming in the internet, and you're not monitoring that. And that's what I'm seeing with all my clients over all these years: is the internet in amazing people's homes, the indoctrination, the relationships online that have happened have stolen our kids into a cult, lots of different kinds of cults. Um, so this is a really good one too. Um, what is it that's influencing our kids? The online influences are, are, to me, the pivotal piece that matters to your kids are influenced by online or anywhere else. And so how you navigate that is really important. Um, what is stunting our kids' growth? So this is going to be particularly <coughs> boys. Because you're on for a second. And actually more like preventing is probably a better word. But porn is one. It, it's turning boys into consumers, if you will, and their belief and vi vision of sexuality is animalistic, is disgusting. Sad thing is it's on the rise for women as well, because they're going, hey, who, this is who I should be. No, 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 no. You should never have that as your goal in any way, shape, or form. But this is shaping a generation. It's just a video game play. Like, I'm not talking about video games just in general, it's the excessive. It's the guys wearing diapers to keep playing. It's the, my friends are knocking on the door and I'd rather play online with my people I've never met than or I'm gonna skip this and skip that to play. That's where it's getting dangerous, especially for boys. Some girls, but especially for boys. The third one, absent fathers. There's a lot of dads that are there, but not there. The role of a father is so critical. Those of you in youth ministry, the role that you play Men, especially, in that role is critical. When I was in seminary, the number two, two or three people I heard that influenced them in their life were teachers, youth pastors, and coaches. But I've also seen that on both sides of the equation. Who made me run for my faith? Who made me run for myself, hate myself, because of this horrible coach? It can be good or bad, but the influence we have is incredible. Um, and these are the th three things that are kind of the critical ones for boys, but there's a few more I want to add to this. Irresponsibility, skillless, it blows my mind how many people can't just change a tire or radiator for that matter. Um, with YouTube, you can do anything, so do it. But um, my daughter has done change the radiator. It's, if it needs replaced, you just do it. It's, you can get the video out and figure it out. But that's not how a lot of people think. They need to try and fail and try and fail. One day we were changing the tires, changing the brakes and brake pads and, and calipers and the whole things on our van, and we were stuck. We did not have the strength to break a bolt loose. Yeah. And my 12-year-old boy goes, well, Dad, if we actually put the, put the wrench on there and get a jack and just start jacking the jack up on the wrench, mm -hmm. it'll break loose. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're brilliant. Yeah. And it worked. It was so cool. He was so proud of that. Yeah. Um, and it's, and it's, it's incredible when you succeed at something, what that does to you. And if you're going, hey, I'm 14 and I walk to the store for the first time, whoop de doo. Versus eight, hey, I walked to the store for the first time. It's interesting to see the difference. There's also a window of when this is really impactful and when it's eh. Um, and then social media, we're seeing is a big deal. I want to turn a corner a little bit and show you something else. So in 2023 and 2024, there have been some absolutely, I think, critical books that have come out. Um, I've made my students read them. I'm, I'm consuming, I've put stuff on my podcast about them. Like I, to me, this is really critical. And again, it's frustrating that these are coming from secular voices, not Christian ones. But I think they're hitting the nail on the head. One of them is this one, Lost in Transnation. She is in her 70s, psychiatrist, and she's like, I'm pretty much probably going to lose my career over this. But hey, I'm in my 70s, so bring it. <laughs> Love her. Miriam Grossman, she was on the documentary, uh, What is a Woman? Um, she's the only one that had like the same, same voice um, in there, but really incredible. So here's some takeaways from this book, some just really important nuggets for us to think about. Um, and again, I'll say that if you do not, someone else will. We've got to go there. Parents, but also even as leaders in our churches. So first thing, schools. A reality today is teachers make claims that if parents are not 100% affirming, they are the child's parent now. 
the people in the school systems, many school systems across the country are saying, if your, your parents want to affirm you, I, I am not your parent. I, I will take over. There are go bags for you to leave your family and run away. And it's scary the story she shares in here about kids who, who were assisted in that way and raped and human trafficked and you name it, some of the disgusting stuff they've been through because it's not the answer. You don't separate parents from their kids. And yes, there are some bad parents out there and that's, that's difficult. Counselors, the reality today is can, you, can your local counselors be trusted to come from a biblical worldview? No. I honestly would not trust most Christian counselors right now, which is hard to say because I am one. Mm -hmm. And I would have critical questions but to ask first, what is your stance or what are you going to say to my son or daughter when it comes to their sexual identity? Or their, what gender am I? And why are they doing this? Why are they terrified to lose their license? Everything I do actually has me, my license on the, on the chopping block. Because I'm speaking out against, and I know it's just a matter of time, and, and I'll be dealing with losing mine. Bring it. I've already had threats um, sent to my university demanding I be fired um, from the school system, from others saying I'm this hateful, horrible person. And the irony is they were basing it off of a YouTube video that I have of me speaking at a middle school group where 90% of the slides were scripture slides. Interesting, which is cool. It got a lot more views because they all watched it. But anyway, <laughs> and I'll show you, a, I'll give you a link to that in a second because to me that's really important um, to, to watch and think about. So, but can you trust them? Not necessarily. So it's just because they have a fish on their business card, don't just trust them. You need to ask some critical questions. And I would actually say, don't send them alone. But we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. I, I, would, I do family only. I don't work with teens or kids alone. I work with the family. Why I'm not there at 2 a.m. when the crisis happens. Mom and dad, I want to help equip you. Brother, Older brother, older sister, I want to help equip you. And so that's kind of what I've been doing for the last, gosh, seven or eight years. Gender identity, made up term from the John Money in the 1950s. It's not new. It's actually very old. And if you haven't studied John Money or Alfred Kinsey, don't go there. But it's depressing. Very, 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 very sick individuals. And everything they've done in their research is actually um, heartbreaking. The abuse and the, the damage. The two boys, everything that gender identity is based on from John Money, literally both committed suicide. One by drug overdose and one so kind of unintentional and one intentionally. Um, because one of them, had, they, one of the boys, they accidentally um, cut his penis off during a circumcision, so they decided, let's raise him as a girl, and let's become this experiment. And, Gender, you know, sexuality is just taught. So when he found out older, he flipped out, and um, it's heartbreaking his story. But all the research had already been published, and it has become today the norm, which is not know your history. Now, Albert Kinsey is a son of a Methodist pr professor, um, grew up in Mess's home, but hated his father and the abuse, and ran from it. And his story is heartbreaking. Died of bajillion STDs and. If you were part of his research team, you had to share you and your spouse with the whole research team and your kids. And they experimented on everyone in the team, and that's part of the research, how they found out stuff about kids while experimenting on them, one another. It's, it's disgusting on every level. Yet, if you take a human sexuality, sexuality class now at most state universities, Alfred Kinsey is a god, a research god. It's no. He went to prisons and he would interview uh, sex offenders and then go, hey, when you get out, will you send me more data? And they would. And it's so not okay. And that's what all this stuff today is based on. We need to expose some of these lies. She started exposing some of these in this book. Professional organizations. The Castro Consensus. What is that? Learn from Fidel Castro. What is it? My way or the highway? Cancel you. You do what I say. It's kind of like the whole Putin election recently. He won. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> yeah, because that election wasn't rigged at all. <laughs> no, Castro is evil dictator. That's what's happening among all the professional organizations. If you don't follow the, the party line of the W path, which has been exposed now, so wonderful all that's coming out about them, um, which is the, what's the, the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, W path. Um, in the last three weeks, a whole expose has come out showing all their, all the, they, they know they're not 
they don't know what they're doing and it's all experiments and that they're doing harm and they know that they just don't care because it is millions and millions and millions of dollars so i see a, tr a trend and a tide turning with the transgender stuff in america it has all over the world except america mm -hmm. so there's hope but there's going to be a generation of devastated um, kids and young adults which is heartbreaking a child is not a miniature adult and we're trying to have children make decisions in oregon where i live a 12 year old can go have an abortion my daughter is 13. so if my daughter ends up pregnant she can go get an abortion and us never be told all i can think of is someone other than that baby needs to die because how did she get pregnant it wasn't immaculate conception i need to find that boy or man and he needs to die i'm the dad <laughs> Instead, it's, oh, no, 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 she's got this right that's not protected. It's, it's horrifying. It's not okay. They're not a miniature adult. And that's really, really important. Society, the, the harmless allowance of social transitioning is the gateway drug, according to the research. So parents, after, Christian parents on galore have just allowed their child to go to school and socially transition and become the other gender and do all this because it's harmless. And what they have found is when you do that, 90 plus percent keep going. The extreme majority take the next step to hormones and other stuff. Not necessarily surgeries, but they take the next steps. So this is where we have to say no. There is no social transitioning. And so she really clearly outlines that and says, here's the boundary. But that, because if you leave them alone and they don't do that, 93 to 95% after puberty, surprise, surprise, choose to become the gender or the sex they were assigned at birth. And this is sickening and horrifying and it's a cult and it's not okay we need to speak out carefully gently but very firmly that this is not actually going to solve anything it's going to actually make it worse and here's where it goes to a new word if you haven't heard this word iatrogenic persistence what is iatrogenic induced unintentionally by a physician or surgeon or by medical treatment or diagnostic procedures i, I turn you into a lifelong patient um, and that's what psychiatry is as well in some sense which on a drug that you're going to need forever yeah. this is what's happening this iatrogenic persistence we need to actually stop this and help prevent that kind of stuff again by education and here's an even scarier one cps again erosion of the parent-child bond rehoming of your child is possible it's happening across the country there are lawsuits going on across the country CVS could come and try and take your child away. I have friends right now that are fighting the government to keep their kids in Oregon because you are not affirming and you are now dangerous and you're transphobic and so you, we need to go put them somewhere where they're safe. Most kids are, in, are actually safer in their homes. I know there are really bad homes. I know. And, I, and, and we need to deal with that too. Separate issue. It's become we've kind of muddled it all together, which is really scary. And so parents, you need to protect your marriage. This is the one of the areas I work in the most. When I see kids that are transitioning or dealing with gender stuff, I also tend to see a couple almost ready to divorce. Because one is going to use the pronouns and one refuses to. One allow, will allow them to come to the house, the other one doesn't want them to. They handle it different. It's kind of like grief. If a child dies, the more likely the couple is going to divorce. It's like a 90% divorce rate. It's horrifying. Why I can't handle looking at you? How could you go back to work and I'm still stuck? Mm -hmm. We need permission to handle things different. So I spend a lot of my time, I run a support group at my church focused on this, loving on these couples and saying your marriage is critical, but here's even a better, more important picture. You still have a mission. You're still here for a reason. So who can you love on? Who can you serve? What's your purpose? Because if it's just to rescue your child, you're gonna be waiting a long time potentially because it's rarely you that's going to do the rescuing. It's praying for other people to step in and other people to influence and to, to, to build into them. And so here's a resource I love. It just came out last year also. Uh, Shanti Feldman and my mentor, Michael Seitzma, uh, Secrets of Sex and Marriage. Incredible book. There's a workbook. There's an online like videos with it. I love, Michael is one of my, I just love him. He's an amazing, godly man, former Wesleyan pastor, who left that and became a sex therapist, started the Institute for Sexual Wholeness. And so I've known him for 20 something years. But this is a really, really solid researched 
and practical book for couples to really um, do together or do in a group. And then, oh yay, <laughs> my favorite day in the world, 21 years ago. So great. I was so sick right there, it was terrible. But I had Crohn's, so it was killing me. But another one, euphemisms, language hijack. There's a zero percent regret rate. No, there's not. They don't do the research. They don't keep the data. There's a sub, the percentage of regret rates like skyrocketing. No such thing as top surgery. It's called a double mastectomy. And she gets really spicy on this one. She goes, I've had one. I had cancer. <laughs> and these girls are going and doing this for fun. Um, it's not called top surgery. Stop calling it top surgery. It's double mastectomy. And it's perfectly good breasts being destroyed for what? Joy of binding? No. Binding, it destroys the breast tissue and actually destroys growth. And it actually does a lot of damage to the body. And so we need to, and that's being done by teachers and people kind of in the background that can buy it online or get it for free online, which is a chest binder, wrap around and press in the breast. A faux vagina or penis? What's a faux vagina? She calls it an open wound. So you take the penis and put it inside and make a hole for some purpose, intercourse, but it's not going to work really, because now you've got to use dilators every day, many hours, many hours per day in the first few months, and then every day forever to force this open wound to stay open. That's what it is. And what's so sad to me is you think of what's actually happening to their bodies is forget ever having an orgasm for most. The extreme majority will never have an orgasm, never have a sensation that's good on the sexual realm it destroys all the nerve endings that stuff's not being told to the patient let alone they're also a patient at the age that can't consent mm. so we need to be careful and understand some of these things and here's an even scarier one i never heard of this one trans is old nulo is the new one a eunuch a man who doesn't feel like he's anything and so goes in and has everything removed and just kind of flattens it all out and i'm nothing this is on the rise, and doctors have to say, sure, because you can do, you do you. And this is increasing in our culture. Um, really sad. And then this one's really a good one, a good thing. The suicide data often quoted is a myth. But we actually are not at, in America yet, and they are in other countries. About seven years post-surgery is when the, the suicide rate skyrockets. We're not there yet. Hang on, we need to be loving on these, these men, women, confused, whatever, because suicidality is going to increase even more, most likely. Um, this is heartbreaking. But the data actually shows from Sweden that all of, the, all of the kids that were in the pipeline to have surgery but didn't get to, and their, their big push was we've got to do it soon, we've got to do it soon because they'll kill themselves, they'll kill themselves, we've got to do it soon. And they keep data because it's socialized medicine. Those that were in the pipeline to, that were waiting, at a zero suicide rate. It's, this is a scare tactic. Do you want a dead daughter or a live son? It's a scare tactic, it's not okay. In my support group, as different couples have joined the group, one of the things that we've noticed, because then they share their story, we almost start laughing going, that's the same story that they shared and they shared. It's like they're reading from a script, because they are, it's called the internet, it's called a cult. Same things happen, same words to parents, Same almost everything, it's not okay. So we need to see that and be able to be gentle and be careful, compassionate, but also biblical. And what is this? And this is a, a fought against term, but it's actually, to me, accurate. It's rapid onset gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria used to be only in men, pretty much. Men that wanted boobs, basically, men that wanted to be women, They're very messed up and confused, adult men. And all of a sudden, there's this surge of girls. What is this? And like 20 at one school happening at once. Or I met this one white, one, one a mom, and she's like, all three of my kids are. I'm like, not even statistically possible. And I wanted to say, what did you do <laughs> or not do? Um, it's so heartbreaking. It's a social contagion. Just like cutting, and just like a lot of our things we've seen over, over time. Um, but this is doing more destruction than we can imagine. If you go to her website, miriamgrossmanmd.com, there's actually a um, link to a, a um, form or a, a Word document that you can use with your schools. And it's 
from parent notice to schools. It's a really good document to start with, saying, hey, I'm not playing this game. I need to know what's going on with my kids. You're not allowed to transition them socially without my consent, all these things. It's really sad, but she's got some really good resources on her website. Now, right around, right after this book came out, another one did. The, again, the secular, three, three non-Christian therapists, they're speaking the truth when kids say they're trans. It's a pretty dense book. It's pretty it's kind of a hard to read, um, but packed full of really helpful tools by three therapists saying, alarm, 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 alarm. One's from Ireland, the other two live in the United States, and that's what they do. They work with kids and families. They qu are quoted saying this, parents who have successfully helped their children navigate gender distress without resorting to surgery or hormones have done so by authoritatively taking the reins. Yes not waiting until they found the right therapist or doctor. As soon as you walk into a doctor's office or a therapist's office, more often than not, you're handing them over. There's such privacy laws now for our kids even. I would almost say, find people in the church, find others, be careful who you talk to. And this is a term I have not heard. These parents, we have to insulate them against the messages that their sex will, uh, will or should determine their interests. It takes about eight years for kids to understand gender constancy. That was an interesting thing to think about. Okay, let's take that data and the, her research, their research and go, I'll, I'll talk to you in eight years. Yeah, you'll be a 20 something at this point. And yes, there will still be some that are struggling. There'll still be some, they often tend to be struggling with a lot of mental health issues, other abuse issues. There's more there than just, I'm in the wrong body. I don't think there's any, anything we have to do when our kids present as gender non-conforming. Love them, walk alongside, but we don't need to do anything. And they're giving parents that permission, if you will. We need watchful waiting mm -hmm. and address the causes. Social transition, again, confirming what Dr. Grossman said. Social transition appears to set kids on a path to medical intervention, and medical intervention can have significant health consequences. Mm -hmm. And the mental health of young people who have transition tends to get worse instead of better, based off their research. So, so true and scary. You, parent, may be more effective at helping your child through this experience yourself rather than going to a therapist. Get equipped. Read some of these books. Um, very, very important. Parents, take the time to make concerted efforts to place boundaries upon their child's online engagement. And more has come out since about that as well. Um, it's our job to help our children orient and adapt to reality, to inoculate against harmful beliefs that their body is wrong. And then rapid on onset gender dysphoria, it's a feeling of dissociation a young person experiences from their body and their biological sex, typically following extended periods of time spent online. Mm -hmm. Comparison, especially for girls. Instagram, big deal when it comes to comparison and hurting so many. And then I love that they went into this one too. Parents of autistic children, teach them that they have the gifts and challenges that come with being neurodivergent. Because the, the numbers here are astronomical that end up choosing this route because it makes sense to them because they don't really feel either or, which is actually normal. So now this year, you've heard it mentioned actually today or yesterday, this book came out, Bad Therapy. I, to me, it's a, it's a game changer, honestly. Uh, I think, and, and Dr. Barner today even mentioned it in terms of the worldview, not necessarily mental health. We all have a mental health. How are you managing it? I deal with depression. My body fights, fights me towards being depressed, and so I work more. I found that when I, I have four jobs and if I keep going, it actually helps me stay out of that space. My worst season is May. Why? My college students abandon me. Like, I love what I do, and so when they leave, I have a hard time. December is a little hard too, but May is the, is the worst. So finding things to, to fill your life with. I have had kids. In four years, they will be gone, all three of them. And I'm actually worried about what is that May going to look like? Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to deal with that. I have my best friend with me, so her and I will do stuff together. But this book kind of says, hey, the way we're doing counseling for kids and teens, if it was working like breast cancer awareness has lowered breast cancer deaths. Mm -hmm. Teaching, training, 
why is what we're doing, our kids are more therapized, more medicated, and everything is worse. What we're doing isn't working. I love her approach. Don't agree with everything, but that's not the point. The point is to think and think for ourselves. As therapists, to think, hey, what am I doing? Helping or hurting? Am I actually moving my, this client I have further away from their parents and I'm becoming the problem? Or am I helping bring them in with their family? That's, so what I've done in reading this book, I literally have laid everything I do out on the table. And some of it in front of my classes that I teach. I'm very vocal about <coughs> where I'm at, what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling and struggling with. And um, they don't always like that. But um, is, is what I'm doing working and helpful or not? We've got to be able to go there. You know what you said, I, I feel like I've had that experience. I'm a, a clinician as well. And I almost feel like at times, as much as I love helping people in mental health, is I feel like we go overboard and mental health is now an idol. Yep. Mm-hmm. Exactly. We have some kind of like that yep. there's going to be this ultimate place of mental health that we're all going to get to mm-hmm. and it's going to be so wonderful. Mm-hmm. And it's like. And literally, your mental health is. A st- the way I put it is how steep is your hill to climb? The goal is still the same. If you have ADD, severe ADD, or you have other diagnoses too, your hill is really steep, okay, the goal is still the same. That you live for Christ, that you find a good you know, job, that you, you know, family, whatever it is, but the goal is still the same. Instead, I feel like we kind of lower, well, you have this, we're going to lower the bar now. Mm-hmm. We're going to aim for you just to live in the basement. Mm-hmm. No, flood the basement. <laughs> no, get out, live life, do life. Yet yeah, we have a stunted generation that doesn't know what to do next and so her um the, the abigail schreier she wrote the book by the way irreversible damage if you don't know her she's a journalist she talks about these things healers can harm again going into iatrogenesis that we are creating clients for life basically um and then social emotional meddling so the idea that we're always checking our kids, how do you feel, how do you feel, how do you feel? Yeah. We're so focused on their feelings, they're like, I'm bad all the time. <laughs> so am I. <sighs> this is not helpful. How do I, and the stuff we've heard all weekend, all week, of how do I build my faith, even in the midst of a storm, is critical. How do I handle after the death of my spouse? We're not teaching, we can't teach our kids that yet, but we're doing the same thing. Your best friend moved away. Um, bad things have happened. How do we help them be resilient? Mm-hmm. It's actually through facing those. Uh, full of empathy and mean as hell. I like that one. Um, we're not doing gentle parenting. We, she calls it therapeutic <coughs> parenting. You know, I'm going to always soften everything and make sure you're okay. Mm-hmm. No, they need some tougher. That's actually why I think God gave us dad and mom. And we're different. And uh, one day my daughter was like, You yell too much. I was like, I need you to go somewhere and find out what yelling is really like. Because <laughs> if I just raise my voice just a little, for her, that's yelling. But I'm like, you've never heard me yell ever in my life, except at the dog. So, like, they, they need to, and that's where being in other family, families, seeing home, other homes, and being around other people helps. Um, but here's what kind of where she goes to. Maybe there's nothing wrong with our kids. Uh, and this will be our final session. We need to end it. Um, what if taking the risk is the only way to feel ready? And then, what if the solution to adolescent mental health is to outgrow adolescence? Yeah. Yeah. And part of what I think about that is I think of, at 12 years old, most are actually could be capable of having a job. Can't legally yet. But if we raise the bar after what we expect from a 12-year-old, 13-year-old, 14-year-old, it would change their own sense of self-worth and value. And instead, you go, well, I did my two and a half chores check. I get my room and board, like that kind of thing. And there's all this entitlement yeah. versus ownership of. Um, and then there's the one, another book that was mentioned that just came out three weeks ago, The Ancient Generation. It talks about the play-based childhood moving now to a phone-based or screen-based childhood. Um, what is it that he exposed in his research? This is the author, one of the authors of Calling the American Mind, by the way. Um, he found that 2012 was the, mo- the magical year. So 20, up to 2010, you got flat lines of all these different issues, and then you've seen anxiety and depression skyrocket among um, Americans, basically. Admitted for non-fatal self-harm. 2012, it starts going up for girls and went up a little bit for boys. Suicides, it's kind of been 
going up since 07, it looks like, for girls. But then it started going up really fast, 2012. What's 2012? So his claim is Instagram. Mm -hmm. When Facebook buys Instagram. Mm -hmm. So smartphones started the process, started the problem, but that's his claim. Don't say that, I don't think that's the whole story. I agree with what's been said you know, at the conference is this is a heart problem. It's what I worship problem, it's purpose problem. That's actually the answer that we need to get to. His solution though is this. No smartphone before high school, no social media before 16, preferred 18, a phone free schools, and then more free play. Every school that's added an extra recess or two, grades have gone up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most schools have dropped recesses or lessened them. They need that free time, free play. I've loved homeschooling our kids, or my wife's done most of the hard work, but I've loved as a family doing that because we've been able to, to play and do life together. Um, we do Boy Scouts. We have a Christian troop of just dads, and we have we get to go camping every month, year round. It's been amazing. Those are my closest friends, these dads, from all walks of life. Uh, building community, like our kids need that. And at school, they get a taste of some, some community, but it's not always good. The youth group's not much better sometimes. So what do you do with that? How do you help them make decisions? Um, so I like this, but it's still not where I think you and I want it to be. Smartphones, I think we need to rethink them completely. We have to start with us though, yeah. and our relationship with our smartphone. Social media, I agree, maybe 18 or later, we need to have a different relationship. With. I love social media. I have been in touch with my friends from Chile that I have not been to Chile since 1992. Since I haven't been there since then, I've been in touch with them this whole time. I love that. I've taught for 20 years. I'm in touch with so many students and get to celebrate their successes and pray for them when they're struggling. And I love that, but it's like, it's this double-edged sword. And so we have to be careful. So let me show you where I go with this. So this was some of the data research. What I do and some of the presentations I do at churches and youth groups, and this is online on my, my YouTube channel, Dr. Gilbert, or Dr. Corey Gilbert. Um, I've got tons of trainings there. I have some friends of mine that actually use some of those in their youth group. They will show the video and then have a discussion. Um, but it looks at a created order, disorder, and then you. And so I'll give you just a little piece of it because we don't have time to go through all of it. But what is it? There is a created order. Yes. You were created. God created mankind in, the own, in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And in the garden, when he created man there was something that we get out of order as well in the garden there was work prior to the fall we act like work is this horrible thing no wonder our kids don't want to launch and work my three kids my daughter at 13 is mad at the world right now because she can't have a job because she grew up in our home and she thinks that the world is just mean because she's why can't i get a job um, my old, middle guy has had one since 14 washing dishes at the at the college I teach at. And it's funny to watch that. He's so social. He hated every minute of the job because he's locked in this room washing dishes. It's like, what did you learn? You learned that you need to be out there. My other son, Chick-fil-A, he doesn't like people. <laughs> so he learned that he needs to be awake. So then his next job was working grounds at Corbin. He's like, oh, that was too, too much. No people. Good. You're learning. That's what this is all about. <laughs> I almost quit high school because I had this amazing job making four twenty-five an hour, and I was just rolling in money. I could buy CDs all I wanted, and it was at McDonald's. My parents fought me to not quit because I thought I was I had it made. I'm so glad they didn't let me quit. Work is a part of pre-fall. We gotta remember that. It got harder, but it's pre-fall. The woman, the Lord, got, the Lord basically wasn't done, so He made better. My daughter says that about her being born as a third child. We had two and then perfected it with the third. But anyway. <laughs> um, God created woman as a helper, suitable for him. And then what came out of this marriage? This is why a man leaves his father and mother is united to his wife and become one flesh. Yes. And then there's a critical piece here. Two sexually different people. You still don't have to say that. It is not two people of the same sex. It is two sexually different people. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. One of the books I have my students read is this one now. It came out last year. This is the Bible before same sex marriage. 21 conversations. The 21 reasons why people say it does. And then he refutes every single one. 
really good book, very solid saying, here's the biblical reason why the traditional sexual ethic remains. And so I have my students read that because they don't believe what I believe anymore. They've grabbed onto the world. Oh, yeah, I love that picture. Can you go back right quick so I can, oh, yeah, there you go. But they're on the QR code. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then this is my family. There's, there's our church directory picture. <laughs> <laughs> That's about as good as we can get. <laughs> we had bets when our kids were going to be born if they're going to be redhead or not. <laughs> they are. And they grow up. Lazy cycle. Yeah, right. Yeah. And then what happens after that is children. Procreation. Yeah. Which we didn't think we could have children. So God's good. Amen. And these three experiments. <laughs> <laughs> This is all last summer, a road trip. My joy. Because then after all this is disorder. This is the part we don't like. What's disorder? We understand it very simply. It's called sin. And so this goes on. This the thing goes on here with, okay, what's sin? Genesis 3, 6, 7. We talk through it. I'm not going to have time to go through all of this. But then what comes after sin? The, we love this word. Yeah. It's the woman you gave me. <laughs> we still do this, do this to this day. It's all blame. It's my sibling. It's, my, it's your fault, Mom. It's your fault, Dad. we got to stop it and own your stuff. Mm-hmm. Start with us. <laughs> we got to start with us. But then training them to not default to this. What does the helper fail for Eve and the leadership fail for Adam? Well, the man will struggle with, with and return to earth, and woman will have pain and childbirth mm-hmm. and struggle with man. This is a relationship that's going to be difficult. 1992. This is where I grew up. So, 10 years. Temuco, Chile. Um, went to school there. With that, junior year of high school, my parents decided we're moving back to the States. Um, they hated me. So, I moved back to the United States between junior year and high school, high school, senior year of high school. And uh, it's amazing to see God's hand in that, too. If we hadn't moved back. My mom had breast cancer 10 years earlier, um, mastectomy and chemo, I remember it vaguely as an 8-year-old, now I'm almost 18, and we moved back, and she has a routine checkup, and that she would have had 11 months later, that she probably would have died. And it's such a confirmation that we had obeyed God in a very hard decision. Because I remember my mom saying to my dad, you can go back to the States, but me and the kids are staying here. <laughs> and I was like, right, mom, you tell them. And a month later, we're packing up, moving. Um, I was a mess. I hated America. I didn't. My grandmother had died four weeks before I was to see her after not seeing her for four years. Um, I didn't know myself. This was me, by the way, back then. <laughs> 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 Everything I owned was purple and pink, and uh, major in music, so that didn't help any. Um, I didn't know what was up or down. I worry if I today was this person mm-hmm. in school, mm-hmm. God help me. Yeah, because yeah. the options weren't there. Now the options are there. I, that scares me because it's so cool to think about the people that didn't mentor me and guide me, help me see that no, music's not going to be it. And here's a gifting, and here's a calling, and here's the direction that just changed my world. I have Crohn's. I deal with a gun to my head all the time, trying to take me out. When I met my wife, I was walking with a cane and told I'd never have a job. In our 10 months of dating, um, I was in the hospital three times. And so she married me with the understanding that she would work and I'd be at home. And she's been a stay-at-home mom for the last eight, 16 years, since her second was born, 16 years. Yes. So excited. And I ride a Harley every day. Um, oh, yeah, there's my picture. I ride a Harley to work every day, um, rain or shine. And, may, and when I'm on it, every time, it's I'm not in a wheelchair. I'm not in a wheelchair. Like even to be able to stand here today is to me just such a thank you, Lord. Because that's not where we were at 20 years ago. I still have Crohn's. It still takes me out. It took me out six weeks ago or so because I ate something I shouldn't and things all shut down. And, um, we learned to manage it. Life together as a couple. Um, those pipes weren't loud enough, so I got better ones. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Oh yeah, my wife used to ride, and then after our third was born, she's like, we can't both die. I said, like, whoever's babysitting gets the kids, but she didn't like that answer. Um, and my kids, I love pulling up to pick them up like at karate or something, and our parents glaring at me like, what a terrible parent, and she rides off grinning. <laughs> it's great, but living, this is, what it, this is what it's about. Every time I'm on, I don't go anywhere else anymore. I used to, I just have time. I ride to work and back. But it's, I do life, and I do it with my family. This past few months, I've had season tickets for skiing for the first time ever with my oldest, because he leaves for college in August. And so then I'm looking at the next two. It's like, what do I have the next few years with them? And then it changes. I'm excited how it's going to change. But it's doing life with them. We have... We only have a short amount of time with them, so how do I walk alongside them. This is kind of something I developed for this stage of life. I need to help them have a vision, a code, and a cause. What is that vision for masculinity, femininity, spouse standards? You need to know what you will not settle less for when it comes to who you're going to marry. Because you will fall in love with the wrong kind of person easily. Because those emotions are not trustworthy data. Attractions are not trustworthy data. Careful with that. Family code, you come from a family. You were trained in some way. We don't tend to have really good rites of passages. We need them. We actually need to rethink that, I think, greatly. There's some really good resources and books out there for, for dads and sons and families. We need to do that. Significant tasks, local consequence, logical consequences, and grace deposits. These are so critical that we invest in our children and we help them succeed to work. Same for in our churches. If you're doing everything by yourself, probably not doing it right. I remember my, my father-in-law was a pastor. One day he came and he said, I finally figured out what needs to happen. You need a new pastor. And everyone's like, Dah! He goes, no, I need to change. Where he was that lone ranger who came and he turned everything on and he's the last one to leave and he did everything. He's like, I need to delegate to you to be the church, to other stuff. And the church changed when he started doing that. That's an incredible Skill, it's not easy to trust, well, humans. So my dad said a good bumper sticker would be, um, ministry's great if it weren't for people. <laughs> it's true, but, but here's the, this other one, a cause. How are you impacting or going to impact others for better? Finding a cause to fight for. I want my 12-year-old and 13-year-old and 14-year-old to have something bigger than themselves. Join right to life and do something great there. Join something... Because otherwise, they're probably going to go join something they probably shouldn't join. Some place that, some cause that actually isn't healthy or good or um, good for them. I want to plant scripture into them, as we've seen this, this week. Um, I want to plant scripture. I want scriptures like this on gender and sexuality. You created, my, you created, you, you, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Fearfully and wonderfully made. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to the earthly nature, sexual morality, impurity, lust, evil, desire, greed, which is idolatry. I want them to, to see that. That when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. This is what you get. But the Holy Spirit produces these kinds of things. We're planting these seeds of, of a worldview in their hearts that helps change their lives and their future with the filter they're using. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross. You and I have desires that need to die. So I need to tell that to my son. Hey, I have this or I have that. Be careful with that. But they need to know that I'm doing this too. And I'm with you in this journey. And I walk alongside you. That actually I'm self-centered bent. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. In humility, value others above yourselves. Your trans or gay or lesbian best friend or other friend or your child's best friend that you really don't like, but you love them. You walk alongside them. You mentor them. Always pointing to the cross. That's the whole point. They may not choose that. That's their choice. Because you're not the one that does it. The Holy Spirit does the work. For some crazy reason, he asks to use us. Which to me is a mistake of the design. <laughs> if he wants to get something done, he probably should use us humans. But he does, which is humbling. And he's using you and I. One last resource. A book I read in 2022, To Be Made Well. 
talks about a, a mom who was the author. She, she's talking about she's up front with the church and they're praying over her daughter to be healed and she starts laughing. It's like, what a bunch of hogwash. <laughs> she's got downs. And they're praying for my daughter to be mad. She's like, she's always going to have downs. So what's her life? What's to be made well with a little girl who has downs? Or who has bipolar? Or who has anything else? There are limits to what you and I can do. So we live within the reality of those limits. And within that reality, it's not a diagnosis. It's within those boundaries. How, how are you made well? I love her heart and the picture in this book of, of redemption. If I am bedridden, because someday I might be. If I'm bedridden, I still have a call. My, my wife said that when I was in the hospital when we were dating, she's like, no matter which nurse or doctor walked in the room, they walked out smiling or laughing because of the way you treated them. Once they left the room, the mouth you had on you was a little... Because <laughs> <laughs> I hate doctors and I hate being hospitals and I hate... And so at least she overlooked that and still married me. But um, I was... I didn't know. I'm like, typed up on drugs. and But it was neat for her to see... It mattered how I treated them in that place. Are you making a difference? Even if you were bedridden, if you're bedridden in your house, what's God calling you to do? With the internet nowadays, you could do amazing things. So how to be made well is critical. And then I've got these resources that I've put together. This one's for parents, and it's got a parent uh, workbook. And then this one's for teenagers. For those that don't want to talk to their kids, here. <laughs> Same thing for them. Um, and really, my favorite review of this the teen book was Dr. Gilbert didn't tell me what to believe he helped me decide what to believe for myself mm. I'm like yes I could not have asked for a better because that's what we want is to help this is biblical <laughs> but you have to decide how are you going to play that out live that out do that because um, we're all going to play this out different in some ways but there's you need to not not waver from the truth of, of scripture so I hope this has been helpful a blessing to you um, honored to serve and so glad to be here. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.